Okay, his topic, he's going to be talking about thinking outside the box with uh, GA4 and Google Data Studio. And I guarantee you, uh, knowing him, there's going to be some, some uh, new ideas come forth in this. There we go. There's Tony. Hey, Tony. Oh, can you hear me? Ah, there you go. Sure do. I'll just adjust my head. Is that me in the middle now? Oh. Looking good. <laughs> There's a delay. Uh, I'm watching the, uh, the live thing. Uh, right. And the slides are there. That's great. That's a bit of a relief. Uh, so I'm Tony McCreith, and uh, as Doc said, my talk's called Thinking Outside the Box with Google Analytics 4 and Google Data Studio. Uh, I'll first apologize for all the excessive emojis on, on this uh, slide. It's, uh, I got a bit carried away. Uh, so a bit about myself, as, uh, as Doc mentioned, I'm not that well known in the industry. Uh, I grew up in Sheffield, England, where I quickly became a computer geek. Uh, this career peaked in Dallas, Texas, where I was a software engineer in the telecoms industry. Uh, I then decided to have a break and I traveled the world. And several years later, I ended up in Adelaide, Australia, uh, where I live today. And that's why you're listening to an Aussie with a limey accent that sometimes says y'all. Uh, this time I became a web developer. And in 2010, I started my own SEO company, uh, Website Advantage. My company is now focused on the big commerce platform, which, where we have two apps. We have the SEO rich snippet app, which implements structured data. And it leads to my classy schema editors that some of you may know, uh, one of the tools that comes from our website. And um, we've recently gone live with our tag rugged app. It's a tag management app for things like Google, Facebook, and Bing. Uh, and uh, it's the inspiration for the talks today, uh, which covers some of the reports we've developed for our customers. Uh, I also do a few things in the SEO community. Uh, I'm a Gold Search Central product expert, i.e. I help out in the Google forums. And uh, due to that, John Mueller has been lucky enough to meet me a few times. Uh, it also meant I helped out in the first virtual webmaster on conference, which was organized by Martin Split and Aurora Morales. Uh, I was helping out in the structured data session where there's some very interesting conversations. I'd recommend trying to attend one. And uh, last year, I was one of the analysts for the HTTP Archive Almanac. I worked on the SEO and markup chapters. And for the SEO chapter, I was privileged to work with the authors, Aleda Solis, who you know, Michael King, and Jamie Indio. So you've probably heard of all of them. I've also done the odd webinar uh, from SEMrush, Sightbulb, and Kate Toon. Right. Uh, so what's today all about? Uh, it's about uh, some novel ideas for reports using Google Analytics, Google, Google Analytics 4 and Google Data Studio. Uh, by the end of this presentation, you'll be able to create several reports that help you dig deep into the website's performance. And in most cases, it's all free. So I'll go through uh, title tag tracking, which shows you how to optimize your titles, uh, how your optimized titles are performing in search. Website errors will uncover the problems your visitors are having when using your site. And Core Web Vitals will help you quickly discover and fix your poor user experiences. And if I have time, you might get a bonus. I've written articles for each of these reports, and I explain step by step how to use them for yourself. You'll see links in the articles at the bottom of the slides, which are catching up. Uh, and the slides will be shared after the talk. For big commerce users that have installed our Tag Rocket app, you already have all the code in place. And at the moment, we create the reports for you. So that's too easy. So why Google Analytics 4? Well, free is always good. The previous analytics, Universal, is centered around page views with events bolted on as an extra thought. In GA4, the events are the main character. They play the central role. This makes GA4 a lot more flexible for use beyond tracking basic website activities. The universal code example here shows, shows how it only lets you send three predefined parameters, category, label, and value. For GA4, you can make up your own parameters. 
The first GA4 example is a standard login event, quite simple. The second shows I can send all the data I want, in this case, about the largest contentful paint for a page. And each event can have its own custom parameters. GA4 can also export its data to BigQuery. This opens up a new world of data analysis and manipulation. BigQuery is the only non-free tool we're going to use today, and it's free until you reach a data usage threshold, which I've not hit yet myself. And finally, I do like to play with shiny new things. Uh, so why Data Studio? Well, GA4 sucks at reporting for a start. Today's reports go outside the norm, which means I need a more powerful and flexible reporting system. And Data Studio is also free. A great thing about Data Studio is that you can copy reports and customize them to suit your own needs. You're not stuck with what I'm going to show you today. And you can connect more to more than just GA4, which I'll demonstrate in this first report. Title tags. They've been in the news, haven't they? Uh, I presume that you're all familiar with title tags by now, and many of you would have optimized them in the past. The aim of this report is to help you track those optimizations to see if they made things better or worse. And they should reduce the need for change logs or spreadsheets. Let GA4 and Google Search Console automatically track things for you. As mentioned, the, the link will take you to an article that will show you how to create your own copy of the reports. In the past, I would fashion a sort of page title report using Universal. Every time it took me several steps to configure the report. And that was just to analyze one page. So I decided to create this richer, more automated report. For each report, I'll start with a brief explanation of how the reports are put together. In this case, we start with a standard GA4 account connected to Data Studio. This provides access to the page titles. To enhance the data, I've also pulled in a Google Search Console property, which I alluded to earlier. In Data Studio, you blend the two data sources together. In this case, they're connected by the page parameters, basically by URL. This lets the report access page level data from both sources. For, ex for example, like impressions from Search Console and page titles from GA4. So let's have a look at the report, which I'm glad we've got slides for on this. Uh, this is the initial part of the report. The first thing to do is select a date range, typically a long one to cover multiple titles. The table here lists all of the pages that showed him a search for that time period. And I've included information from both Google Search Console and GA4, such as clicks and session counts. You can also see how many titles existed during the selected period. This helps you identify pages that are worth checking. At this point, you would click on a page, the page you are interested in. If you then scroll down the report, you'll see another table. This shows all the titles that the pages had. The table includes average daily metrics, such as how many clicks per day a title achieved. This gives you a quick way to compare average performances for each title. And below the table is a series of charts showing how the pages, page metrics have changed over time. This includes impressions, clicks, and click-through rates. At, glance, at a glance, you'll get a rough idea if the title changes to improve things or not. Let's move on to another example. This is my video structured data editor. I'm using this example to highlight that you have to take this data with a pinch of salt. So many things can affect how a page ranks and how many clicks it gets, not just the title. You can't say that a specific title is the best one based on just a glance at this report. So on the 19th of July, Google announced a new video feature for structured data called Seek to Action. This obviously caused much interest in the subject. I quickly added the feature to my editor, making it highly relevant for this top topical subject. So I wouldn't be surprised if impressions increased after that announcement, regardless of any title change. This is just one example showing the weakness of reporting in this way. An improvement could be to perform split testing using groups or pages at the same time, with one group as your control and the other groups as your tests. To aid this, you could identify page groups in GA4 so that you can make the reports show data at a group level. Another improvement would be to dig deeper into the GA4 data. For example, reports on how well titles trigger goals, conversions, or even revenue. Why not also send the meta descriptions to GA4 and do a similar report on that? Or you could even pull in Search Console query data. 
That way you could see change, how changes affect search term ranking. All those improvements would probably need some real data processing, say via BigQuery. If you are interested in search performance testing, I'd re recommend watching Dan Petrovic's presentation tomorrow. It's on click-through rate optimization. And that's it for the first report. Hopefully you'll, hopefully you'll find it useful in tracking your title tag optimizations. Let's have a little break. It's going to be a bit of a heavy session, this. Uh, I'm a bit of a convertible fan. I drove halfway around Australia in one, and he got a few stairs while in the outback. My mate Brad decided to blow up one of my cars. Maybe he's trying to give me another convertible. And Brad is also my employee. Right, let's move on to the next report. Website errors. You may need to Google some of the phrases my dad uses. Website owners and website developers tend to stick their head in the sun when it comes to testing their sites for browser errors. This report is designed to show you those errors that the real users are experiencing. In some cases, it reveals errors that stop them achieving your goal, like buying from you. It's a bit like having your visitors audit your site for you as they browse around. But this report is only for the brave. It's quite complicated to set up. Luckily, I've developed all the JavaScript for you. And it's available via the article link in the footer. I basically hook into different places to detect multiple types of browser error and send them to GA4 and then onto Data Studio. Little secret, if you use the capture mode on the error event, you will see errors when a tag with a source fails, e.g. a broken image. Let's have a look at the report. This report starts with a dashboard. This report starts with a dashboard. It shows errors over time for each type of error that is captured. This gives you a quick way to see if any new issues are happening. The report contains pages for each error type, and we'll go through each one, starting with JavaScript errors. This is a typical example of an e-commerce store that we work with. As my dad says, they were knee deep in JavaScript errors. To help you find the cause of the errors, the table not only includes the error message, but it also includes the file name, the line number, and the column number of where the error happened. That's showing off how GA4 can have many parameters per event. I also include the browser name, as errors are often browser specific. Unfortunately, GA4 does not capture browser version yet. In most of my reports, I find it very useful to categorize pages by their page type. This can help you determine if an area is page type specific. With our Tag Rocket app, the page type comes from the name of the template file used to generate the page. You can set up your own page types in your own way. This example shows that most errors ha are happening in the checkout page. If those errors are affecting the user's experience, they may be stopping people from buying from you. You can also apply many filters to these reports to help you narrow down an issue like limit it to one page type or a specific browser. For a new client, I filtered down to the order confirmation page. This highlighted that the big Bing conversion tracking code was broken. It was an easy fix. I switched them to use the Tag Rocket app. All right, now let's move on to console errors. Some systems report problems as console errors. These are typically less critical, but still worth checking. Some can be ignored, like invalid login. Some are a nice heads up, like the Facebook pixel. If it was added twice, it logs an error. In this example, we see that transaction processing keeps failing. That definitely needs looking into. Now on to network errors. This page shows issues while requesting resources over the network. It includes broken images, scripts, and link tags. These happen when a tag source is broken, for example, at 404s. It also picks up failing requests in JavaScript. These requests could be made by using the fetch function or the XML HTTP request object. It also monitors beacon requests. They are send and forget, which means we can't detect if they fail. 
GA4 uses beacon requests and they batch multiple events into the one request. However, each GA4 beacon request has a limit of 16K. If you exceed that, a warning is posted in the console and the batch of events is not sent. This caused a lot of work in my app to minimize the chances of events going missing. And to help me improve things, my app alerts me whenever a GA4 beacon is too big. And an FYI, Universal does not match, but has a smaller limit of 8K. This is quite often exceeded when sending enhanced e-commerce product data for a category page. So maybe you should test a few of your category pages. In this example, we see broken images, broken CSS files, and a broken script. We're almost there for this report. Next, JSON LD errors. I added this as I work a lot with structured data. It basically finds and tries to pass any JSON LD scripts on the page. Often we would see errors due to poorly encoded content in the markup. This type of error is uh, normally hard to see because uh, it only happens on a few pages, say ones with a quote in the product name. In this example, the error is due to comments in JSON LD, which is not allowed. However, interestingly, Google Rich Results Tester has no problems with it, but I won't start commenting you JSON just yet. The JSON report uncovered one surprising error. If a string in the JSON LD contains a closing script tag, it breaks the JSON LD. It closes the whole script even when inside a string. We solve this by doing a special escape sequence just for that scenario. And it shows that capturing these JSON LD errors help, helps us make our structured data app more robust as well. Right, to the final page of this report, missing pages. Missing pages are never a good experience for users. This page tells you when your users see them. I show a percent at the top to gauge the extent of missing page problems. In this case, 0.41% of pages people view are of missing pages. The main table includes referrer, source, and medium to help you identify when a user lands on a missing page. In this case, in this example, some are Google adverts. So this site is throwing money away by using four or four pages as landing pages for ads. And some are from Google search, indicating the pages were recently removed without a redirect. And they were ranking and causing traffic. Two things that should be easy to fix once you know about them. So that ends the uh, website errors report. I have a bonus tip. In Data Studio, you can set up scheduled emails to remind you to check your errors. It's a good way to keep an eye out for surges in issues. So I hope these few examples have shown you that you should not keep your head stuck in the sand. The brave ones should be setting this report up today. Time for another quick break. In my travels, I started to check out rooftop bars. It's a great way to see places when relaxing and having a drink. Not the best pastime for me as I have an irrational fear of heights. That last photo is of a hotel room in Melbourne. The bed almost touched the wall to all windows and I literally had to crawl into bed. Right, enough of that. Next report, let's look into Core Web Vitals. Now, I presume you've heard about Core Web Vitals over the last year. To sum it up, it's about keeping things small. Small delays and small movements so the user's experience is a good one. This section will go through a couple of use cases where I use my Core Web Vitals report to discover the biggest Core Web Vitals issues and then fix them. As always, the link below shows you how to set this report up for yourself. Field data and real user metrics refer to data acquired from the real users that visit your website. In this case, the metrics we're interested in are the Core Web Vitals. You can get the real user metrics from PageSpeed Insights and Google Search Console and they in turn get their data from the Chrome user experience report, which gets its data from opted in Chrome users, hence real user metrics. The problem is that, that they aggregate the data. PageSpeed Insights only reports on some of your pages that reach a threshold, while Google Search Console often groups pages together to reach their own thresholds. And they, they both only provide a rolling 28 day average for the metrics. Here I'm showing some quotes from the Google Web Dev team. 
They say using their Web Vital script is the ideal setup for getting real user metrics directly from your site's users. You get the true story based on your actual visitors over multiple browsers. No grouping, no delays, no thresholds. As usual, I'll start with an explanation of how the report is put together. I am using the Web Vital script I just mentioned. WebDev did a great presentation at Google I.O. this year, which was very similar to my solution at the time. I've now made my solution compatible with theirs. I've also added a few extras so that we can see more details in the report. This data is not easy for Data Studio to work with, so I first export it to BigQuery. In BigQuery, I run daily SQL script that generates a table that is in a format that Data Studio can use. That's the technical stuff. On to the report. The overview should be familiar. Standard stuff, standard colors. You can apply a date range and a bunch of different filters to the report. I will highlight some of these filters as we go through the report, starting with page type. As I mentioned before, I find page types are very useful in narrowing down where your problems are. I'm, I'm gonna go through a specific use case here and the process that I use to solve the problem. This table shows that the product pages have a big CLS issue, highlighted in red. This led me to dig deeper into the CLS issues for product pages. We can look at the product pages by filtering on that page type. You can see the issue is across the board, CLS issues on all product pages. So let's go into more detail. This table shows which elements on the page cause the biggest CLS issue. The elements are defined by their CSS selector. This means you can paste them into Chrome's elements tab to highlight them on the page. In this case, the worst case, in this example, the worst case is due to a review widget, with the issue being worse for mobile users. But let's not blame the widget just yet. This is the point where we move on to using other tools to work on a solution. First, we visually inspect the page as a mobile user, to see what was happening in relation to the widget. Chrome lets you emulate a mobile device so you can check where the elements are on the page. The re review widget is added dynamically, meaning there's a delay in it showing, and that caused a shift. You can see this in the diagram. This case was a bit confusing as the widget was not move visible on first load, so it should not affect CLS for most people. It would typically have been rendered before people scroll down to it. It is dynamically added to a div tag, which is visible on the load. So I came up with a hypothesis. Even though it's off screen, it was affecting a div that was on screen. The diagram shows how the widget stretches the visible div when it eventually loads, and this is causing the poor CLS score. I came up with the idea of moving the widget outside the div, kind of makes sense, so that it would not affect anything visible when it loaded. Here I use Chrome's overrides and Lighthouse to test this sort of thing. Chrome's overrides lets me edit a page locally so I can privately test any website. I can then run Lighthouse on my edits. So it's kind of cool. Lighthouse includes options to show only the results that affect each specific web vital. In this screenshot I'm showing, I have showing the element that caused the largest contentful paint. This is handy feature to make sure you focus on fixing what is actually causing a web vital problem. Because I often see people focusing on the wrong so-called opportunities. At the moment, reduced, un un re reduced unused scripts seems to be the current red herring of choice. So back to the solution. This diagram shows how my changes affect the shift. It has no, now has no effect on the visible div. And it worked. Lighthouse indicated that we had improved the CLS quite a bit. I do suspect this particular issue should not have been contributing to the CLS score, as it did not affect anything visible. I'm sure the team will continue to improve on how web vital scores are calculated. With mobile fixed, we then noticed that the desktop device was also having problems. In, the, in this case, we have a more traditional CLS issue where the widget pushes visible content down when it suddenly appears. The solution here was to add a min height to the placeholder for the widget. So when the widget appeared, it had minimal impact on the layout. Testing showed that this also helped reduce the CLS score. 
So we went live with the fixes and to the result. Drum roll, please. We saw a massive drop in the CLS scores for both mobile and desktop, and a drop is good. Above the red line is a poor score. Before the change, mobile was out of the box, out of the park poor. Below the green line is a good score. Mobile and desktop are now in the good books. It went from extremely poor to good with a small HTML and CSS change. A slight variation of this view is based on status, which is good, needs improvement or poor. We wanted the green area to move above the 75th percentile blue line. This means that over three out of four people are getting a good experience, which is what Google wants. So we won that one. Know that we see the real user results by the next day. Due to the 28 day rolling average for Google Search Console, it took 17 days for it to switch to the new good CLS status. So you had to wait 17 days to know if what you did worked. So that's CLS sold. Now onto Lodge's Contentful Paint. This is a very similar process. Find the first element selector causing the biggest LCP issue. In this case, it was the product page again and the main product image on it. Digging deeper and I found that the main image was using a lazy loading system with JavaScript adding the image. The image was not even requested until the lazy loading system loaded and started to run. So I made some more Chrome overrides to hard code the image URL and to do a link preload. Results via the Chrome performance panel look promising. I like to use the performance panel to go deep into what might affect a page's core web vitals, especially things that are timing dependent like Lodge's Contentful Paint. The live changes have only just rolled out, so it's hard to be conclusive. But the first few days data indicate both mobile and desktop have changed from needs improvement to good. For big commerce stores, I've written an article on how to implement these fixes for the base cornerstone theme. And this solution caused me to raise my first Chrome developer bug. The theme supports responsive images via the source set attribute. This means the preload has to also provide the same source set data so that it preloads the right image. When emulating a mobile in Chrome, it was not preloading the correct image. This also means Lighthouse and PageSpeed Insights do not preload responsive images correctly. If you do not use the mobile emulation, you will see that the preload works correctly based on your window size, and you can test LCP using Chrome's performance tools. So this is just a developer bug. Now let's look beyond just Core Web Vitals. Let's merge them with the GA4 data. GA4 has an engagement metric. It's the new bounce rate. I, don't, I decided to check if any of the web vitals correlated to engagement rates. In most cases, it did not. But for LCP, it appeared that engagement drops as LCP increases. Fast pages had over 90% engagement, while slow pages dropped to 60%. So people did not like to hang around. I'm not surprised. How about we look at countries? The top left shows traffic levels per country. This gives you an idea on how significant an issue would be in those areas. The rest shows each metric, with red indicating the poorer scores. Nothing too bad here is the red areas relate to low traffic countries. In some cases, this may highlight countries where your visitors are getting a poor experience. And maybe a solution would be to provide a slim down and faster experience for them. We can also look at users' effective network speed Always have trouble saying that one. This comes from a browser API and provides a user speed in terms of mobile networks, 4G, 3G, 2G. You can see Australia is big on 2G, so we need to catch up. I also noticed that our LCB fix results were better if we filtered down to just 4G connections, indicating that the slower connection was causing the, the bigger problem. You could use effective network value to provide the slim down sites I mentioned on the previous slide. Google adaptive serving for more details on that. So that covers Core Web Vitals. And what's that? We've got through three. I've shown you how to use it to discover your worst user experience problems and to use the knowledge to go from a poor experience to a good one. 
and you can see these improvements within days. Remember that the article in the footer shows you how you can create your own Core Web Vitals reports. And speaking of around the world, here's a rough idea of the places I've visited in my travels. I've still got a long way to go. Can't wait until the Aussies are allowed out of the country or even the state at the moment. So it looks like we've got some time left. So you're going to get the bonus report. Let's delve into the wonderful world of server logs. So server logs are a pain. They're hard to get from the hosting company. My hosting company provides access, but only for the last 24 hours of data. So if you have a problem a few days ago, it's too late. And they're hard to process with many large files that need crunching. And you're limited on tools available to report on them. So I decided to bypass the server log system and generate my own logs. In this case, I'm sorry, you can't play at home. Or at least I don't have an article to teach you how to set this one up. The solution is, is very platform dependent. Mine is for a Windows server and a website using ASP.NET Core. If you do have this set up, I'll be happy to provide some code. By the end of this section, you will have seen server log reports that go way beyond what server logs normally do. This is another report that started off in Universal. Some of you may have seen my tweets with images like this. I report whenever Googlebot switches to a new version of Chrome. I have a Universal account where I send server log data to. This report works by using custom segments to identify browser versions in that data. And then I set up an email alert for when a browser version first gets some hits. Switching to GA4 and Data Studio takes this, takes this to a whole new level. To the architecture. The basic idea is to intercept the server process when it has just sent out a response, gather any interesting data, and send it to GA4. You could do server logs straight to a database or BigQuery. I chose GA4 as it's a free data warehouse and it connects to a flexible reporting system. I added a queue system that moved my logging code into a separate process. This lets the server process continue to deal with subsequent requests without interruption. And it also means my logging code can take its own sweet time in gathering data and send, sending it to GA4. The, the event is sent via measurement protocol, which is GA4's API for sending server to server events. And finally, we connect to Data Studio to generate those pretty charts. So let's look at the first part of the report. It's a standard server log, boring, move on. It's worth pointing out there are many ways to globally filter this report. Remember that we are gathering all requests that make it to the server, users, bots, HTML files, and resources. The next report filters things down to just bots. In this case, I identify bot providers and bot names via the user agent. For example, Google is a provider with multiple name bots. I then do a forward and reverse DNS lookup on the requesting IP address. This is to verify if it's a true bot. It's how Google suggests you check their bots, and it works for other bots as well. And this means we can filter out fake bots, which is great. You can group and manipulate the data in many ways. For example, grouping by user agent. Here I pull out information from the user agent string, for example, browser, version, operating system. And this made me discover a limitation in GA4. You're limited to 25 custom parameters per event. So I had to do a bit of triage to decide which ones made it in. We could also group by URL. In this case, you can see I pulled in some request headers like content type. And I'm monitoring the response to get its true byte size. From this, the table can show the average response size for a URL. And I have a timer for the request receipt from request received to response sent. This timer would indicate if the response is using up a lot of time and maybe CPU cycles. In this example, many of the slow ones relate to very large files, which take time to send all the response data. One of the slow ones actually renders a page on the server and has to wait for the render to complete. So it's designed to be slow. Another one is slow because it's sending an email. Maybe I should look into that one. Next, I decided to go a bit deeper and focus on Google. I'm sure a lot of people will be interested in how Googlebot is crawling their site. As mentioned, I've already filtered out all the fake Googlebots. 
I did last crawl date. So you know if Google has ignored a URL for a long time. Hits and hits rate gives you an idea on which URLs Googlebot likes to crawl. And in this example, two URLs use up over 20% of the crawl budget. Here's a demonstration how you can further filter things down. In each table, you can select a row to filter all charts and tables on a page. Here I filtered down to just smart Googlebot, the main bot. Then I focused on the top URL. The chart now shows hits for just that URL and just smart Googlebot. This shows that Google, Googlebot hit that URL hard for a few days, causing it to be the most hit URL in this time period. All right, that's it for server logs. As you can see, custom exporting a server logs and more combined with Data Studio means you will have instant access to your server logs via a flexible reporting environment. And that covers all the reports for today. As my dad says, the world is your lobster. He likes to think big. I've just shown you examples and ideas of reports I've come up with to help our clients. Don't forget to check out the articles showing how to create your own copies of the reports and that you can customize them to suit your own needs. I'd love to hear your success stories from a winning title tag, maybe the discovery of a major bug or perfect call web vital scores. And on that note, that's all folks. You can follow me on Twitter, Tony McCreeth. Please share your success stories and ideas. The slides and links to the articles are available at min.to slash deepseo. And I guess it's now time for questions. Outstanding. You ever feel like a smart kid in class and go to a class and find out you're not the smart kid? <laughs> <laughs> Try me at languages. That's some brilliant stuff there, Tony. Cheers. Donna's saying that her team loves your reports. They are sexy. <laughs> <laughs> and he's not even showing us his best stuff. I know he's handbagging. <laughs> <laughs> now, uh, well, the, uh, the well, the reason for this whole presentation was I created these reports for clients, and uh, and they just evolved, and they will continue to evolve. Uh, I've already got more ideas on different levels, uh, things like time to first byte. Uh, I'm seeing a lot of issues with clients on slow servers. I was really intrigued by your your uh, development of your own log files. Yeah, that comes from being a software engineer. <laughs> well, yeah, but I, I think that, you know, there are an awful lot of people, as you say, a lot of hosts won't surrender that. And if, if you need it from four days ago, you're out of luck nine times out of 10 anyway. So the ability to actually generate your own log files and determine how how long you want to save them, uh, sure, there's there's a a database size issue there to be considered, but that's that's some wealth of information there that would not be otherwise available. Yeah, and and the way I uh, I'm adding other information to it because uh, the, the log files you get whatever they decided to switch on. Whereas I can switch on everything and more. Well, yeah, uh, and a lot and of so I have pull, I've pulled log files before from my host, and and a lot of times you get like three criteria out of the forty yeah. that are available. <laughs> and so far, I've not hit any limits with. Uh, I've I've done it in Universal for a long time, and now in GA four, and they've never come to me saying you're doing too much. <laughs> Donna, Donna's asking, how often do you find yourself using the server log files? Uh, in reality, uh, that's more of a, a toy thing I did to uh, look behind the scenes on, on what's actually happening on my own website. Uh, so I look at them to do presentations. <laughs> <laughs> nice for forensic work, though. Oh yeah, uh, the uh, some of the things I mentioned there and others I didn't realize were problems on my website until I went through and created these more detailed reports, uh, like uh, that that surge in uh, 
in uh, those requests for a couple of days uh, was a problem on my server uh, and it helped me identify where the problem was. I know when, when it, they first came out with the, uh, the new tool, CLS initially to me was a real challenge because yeah, you can get a readout on, on the fact that you have a CLS issue, but trying to track down where the shift was actually being caused was really challenging. And the yeah, way you're I, going about it, it, it's nice because it, it's no longer challenging, you know, with that tool. <laughs> uh, the, the problem with CLS is if you're trying to do it yourself, you're not doing what the other person did to cause the problem. Yeah. yeah. And whereas this is actually getting real user data, so you're discovering what's affecting most people. And uh, uh, something, something I like is like it instantly put me to product pages. They're a disaster. Uh, because uh, maybe on that side, I think half the traffic was product pages. But uh, are you going to test all those? Are you going to actually test product pages or just do the home page and things? So this actually points you straight to this is your biggest problem. And this is the element that's causing your biggest problem. Fix that and you'll get your greatest you, 80 20 rule. You'll get 80% of your improvement off yeah. those fixing those first ones. Great stuff. 